So if we reject the law, it's the same as rejecting the Son. The rejection of the Son is the same as the rejection of the Father. We are on the very verge of the final conflict and the world needs to be warned. This movement is not to form separate congregations. This movement is to infuse all. So the world is seeing revolt. Well, who's engineering these events? It's not just happening in the Arab world. It's happening in Europe. It's going to come here. People are fed up with everything that's going on in this world. And this is the breach that needs to be repaired in the time that we live in. We can study prophecies, we can know what's happening in the world, we can see all of these things. If we don't start right here with Jesus, we've gone nowhere. In the next few lectures, we will be discussing Daniel chapter 11. Now this must be one of the most complex prophecies in the Bible. And uh, very few people dare to venture on this ground. But I believe that we are seeing the culmination of the events described in these chapters. Now it is not my intention to give a verse for verse expose of Daniel chapter 11, but we will deal with the prophecy and see if we can see a general picture. And then we will deal with the fulfillment as it is unfolding in the world today. The King of the North, part one. Our text for our series is Jeremiah 6.16, Thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. So once again, we are dealing with a conflict. And the battleground is your mind. And the decisions we will have to make will be will have eternal consequences. Here's a quote from Testimonies. Satan is a diligent Bible student. So shouldn't we be diligent Bible students? Yes. He knows that his time is short and he seeks at every point to counterwork the work of the Lord upon this earth. It is impossible to give in any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth when celestial glory and a repetition of the persecutions of the past are blended. We are in serious times. They will walk in the light proceeding from the throne of God. By means of the angels, there will be constant communication between heaven and earth. And Satan, surrounded by evil angels and claiming to be God, will work miracles of all kinds to deceive, if possible, the very elect. God's people will not find their safety in working miracles, for Satan will counterfeit the miracles that will be wrought. God's tried and tested people will find their power in the signs spoken of in Exodus 31, 12 to 18. They are to take their stand on the living word. It is written, this is the only foundation upon which they can stand securely. Those who have broken their covenant with God will in that day be without God and without hope. This is exactly the same thing that Martin Luther said. This is what fired the Reformation. And I believe that will be the issue in the final event as well. Not signs and wonders and great events to convince one this way or the other, but thus says the Lord. Daniel chapter 11 is a, a chapter which many have tried to unravel 
And there are many, many publications which make sense. But then there are always some issues which seem not to fit precisely into the prophecies. So we're going to take a general view. I do not want to be uh, in any way making a stand for one side or the other. We have to get to the basic principles. Also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realms of Grisha. When you look at these first verses, there is no conjecture. It's very plain. You know in which time this takes place. It's in the year of Darius the Mede. And the kings that are to follow, history can tell us who they were. Now Cyrus and Darius were co-regents. Cyrus, Persia, Darius, Medes, they were co-regents. Now if we look at these kings over here and omit the false Smerdis of the Cambyses, who was not of the legitimate line, the three kings after Cyrus and Darius, of course, the co-regent would be Cambyses. He was the son of Cyrus, 530 to 522. Darius the first, 522 to 486. And Xerxes. He's also the Assessorus of Esther, 486 to 465. And then finally Artaxerxes, followed by the mighty king of verse 3, who we will see was Alexander the Great. So we, we know who these kings were, and history confirms them. So these are the kings that Daniel is speaking about. So these are purely historic verses. Cambyses, son of Cyrus, Darius I, not to be confused with Darius the Mede, Xerxes I, also known as Aceros, the book in the book of Esther. And uh, those we can relegate to the realms of history. The following verse, verse 3, And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. If we follow the reasoning thus far, that would be Alexander the Great. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. So Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided into four. And not to his posterity, because he didn't have any, he died young. Nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So this is a description of the rise of the Greek Empire and its final uh, division into four. And these are the Seleucid kingdom, and then there is that of Lysimachus, Cassander, and the Ptolemy. Now the only two that we are really interested in this prophecy are these two, because they represent the kingdom of the north, north of Jerusalem, and Ptolemaic kingdom, which was to the south. So you have a king of the north, and you have a king of the south, and these are the prominent ones which remained of the Greek empire. Now, traditionally, verses 5 to 39, which are the next verses, we're not going to deal with it verse by verse. We're going to have more of an overall picture, as we can see later are interpreted as the conflict between these two powers. So the one in the north and the one in the south, they were conf constantly in conflict with one another. And controlling the north, controlling the south, the agreement of verses 5 and 6, which is sealed by marriage, is considered to be that between Ptolemy, Philadelphus of Egypt, and Antiochus Theos of Syria, who married Ptolemy's daughter. So... Many interpretations are there for these verses, and people try to fit in very 
particular kings and queens, etc., and show the conflicts. But there are so many differences between the various interpretations that it gets a little bit hazy. The overall picture is nevertheless quite clear. And uh, the issue of the daughter, uh, Theos who married Ptolemy's daughter, Bernice, an arrangement that when Sao and Benice was murdered in verses 7 to 15 sketch the conflicts between the Greek north and the south until Rome is introduced in about verses 15 or 16. And some interpret the robbers of thy people of verse 14 as Rome. Others introduce Rome at verse 16. So there are differences of opinion as to how we should interpret the subsequent verses. I'm not going to go through them verse by verse, but let's go to verse 16. For he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Well, history tells us that Rome conquered Palestine and stood in the glorious land. And the he, traditionally being pagan Ro Rome, that warned this Greek uh, king Antiochus for Epiphanes from attacking Rome. Now it's interesting that many people would want to see this Antiochus for Epiphanes as Antichrist, but of course he comes out of the Greek Empire, which is the third empire in uh, Daniel chapter 7. And so he cannot qualify as the Antichrist because the little horn power comes out of the fourth kingdom and not out of the third. And in any case, he had no great power because Rome warned him and he was powerless to do anything against it. So Rome entered the glorious land and conquered it in 63 BC. And this Antiochus Epiphanes IV is not the Antichrist cannot be the Antichrist because he does not come out of the right kingdom. Now, dealing with verses 17 to 30, we are thus in the pagan Roman period and all the intrigues that go along with that. Verse 17 being a possible reference to Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and the saga that uh, revolved around them. So all of these interpretations you will find out there with some variations here and there. If we look at verse 17, it says, He also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but he shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Most people would like to see Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, and the Mark Anthony scenario somehow ensconced in that verse. Verse 18 to 22 deal with the successors. Uh, Augustus Caesar who raised taxes in the time of Christ's birth because the text refers to a raiser of taxes. And Tiberius Caesar, a vile person, verse 21, before whom the prince of the covenant would be broken and Christ, of course, was crucified in that time. So that would seem to fit a literal interpretation of these verses. There is the head of Tiberius Caesar, and the Prince of the Covenant was broken in his time. So that's the general sort of uh, exegesis that most people make of those verses. Now let's go to some of the others. Some commentators link the subsequent verses right up to verse 30 to the Roman intrigues until you get to the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. And others again start introducing the little horn, the papal power, in verse 21, making the vile person the man of sin. So you can see all of these differences, and some think it's this, and some think of that. There is a general trend but how close can we get to a absolute interpretation? And applying the verses to the Crusades, uh, what I would say is for certain is that pagan Rome converted to heathenized Christianity in the time of Constantine and did have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant as we read in verse 30b. 
But from verse 31 one onwards, we get the verses with a very distinct religious flavor. So let's read that one. An arm shall stand in his, on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and he shall take away the daily sacrifice being supplied, not in the original, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Now, the sanctuary, that has a religious connotation, so now we're getting into religious conflict, and they shall place the, the abomination that makes desolate. Jesus referred to that. So now we are dealing with a religious power that is contrary to Christ. So this power from here onwards refers to the religio-political conflict and must therefore refer to papal Rome. So the sanctuary and the abomination that makes desolate are religious aspects refer to the setting up of the false system of worship that negates the ministry of Christ and is accepted by all who forsake the holy covenant as we read in verse 30b. So those who forsake the covenant, who forsake the way of the Bible, the plan of salvation as it is recorded in the Bible, they will side with this power. Verse 32 and 33 refer to the time of papal dominance. Many days would be the 1,260 day of papal supremacy. Daniel eleven thirty-two, 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. So this power makes alliances and allegiances with powers that fight and war against God's covenant. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. In other words, they will resist him. And they that understand amongst the people shall instruct many, that yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. This is the time period of papal persecution, the 1,260 years of Daniel. And uh, I think that is pretty clear. Verses 34 to 35 can be seen to refer to the Reformation. If we read them. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. And we, and we get contacts here with the book of Revelation where the trying and the white appears in the seven churches and we can see that that dealt with the Reformation there. So the language is very similar and I believe this is dealing with the Reformation. Verses 36 to 39 are a description of the nature of this persecuting power. If we read verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. This is the same language that we get in Thessalonians when Paul speaks about this power. And he sh shall speak marvelous thing against the god of gods. This is the same language that we get in the description of the little horn, which the reformers declared to be the papacy and shall prosper till indignation be accomplished. So he will be there until the end. For that that is determined shall be done. So here's a description of this persecuting power. Verse 37 says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So he will turn his back on the God of his fathers, he will regard another God. He will not have an interest in the desire of women. And many interpret this as the churches desiring the desire of ages, Christ himself. He will turn his back upon that. And what will he put in the place thereof? But in his estate, 
in the place thereof, shall he honor the God of forces. Now the God of fortification was Nimrod, who built the city of Babylon and uh, established it. And he was the God of forces or fortification. So it is a, a symbol of Lucifer. And a God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Well, this is history. The papacy has done exactly that. It has decked with gold and glory its images and uh, all of these things in its churches and he did divide the land for gain. He's the one who decided how the maps shall be divided, which part belongs to Spain, which part belongs to that nation. He divided up the world according to his whim. Now, this literal interpretation as we have been through it has merit. But there are places where you cannot exactly pin it down. And so I would want to look at another aspect and this is a fascinating aspect where this north-south conflict is seen as a merism. Now we'll discuss that in a moment. This idea is also shared by Jacques Ducan in his book Secrets of Daniel. And he presents this interesting view that the north-south conflict, verses 5 to 39 in its totality, is to be interpreted as a merism and that the distinctive pattern of the conflict leads to a final fusion of the forces with a common intent. And that common intent of the fusion of the north-south conflicting powers eventually, that common intent is to destroy God's people. And the pattern in the verses is as follows. South against north, North against south, irrespective of now placing particular kings in there, we're looking at the overall pattern and ignoring the detail. You have south against north, north against south, south against north. So you have A, B, C, and then in the next section you have the reverse thereof. So it's almost like a chiastic structure. In verses 40 to 45, which are the final verses of the chapter, the south attacks the north, the north attacks the south, so you have an A-B component. The north attacks the north, which is confusing in itself, as we will see later as we deal with it. Verse 42 to 43a. And then the south allies itself to the north, which is synthesis, they come together followed by the final victory of God over the combined forces of evil. Now in the course of these lectures, we'll deal largely with these verses and we'll deal with them in detail and we will see how they are being fulfilled in the political and economic climate of the time in which we are living right now. So this is an interesting way of looking at it and some themes come out of this Scenario. The three themes of chapter 11 are thus a conflict between the north and the south. Secondly, an alliance between the north and the south, which eventually develops, although there is this constant conflict. And then finally, a conflict with the people of God. So what is the purpose of this conflict? The purpose is to create a collective mindset in the totality of humanity, which will then align itself, this collective mindset, against God's people. Verses 5 to 39 thus describe what we could call a Hegelian sparring between two philosophical systems which have one collective aim. And that's the destructions of God's people and the obliteration of true worship. So the issue is worship. It's a war for worship. Now, let's have a look at this merism. 
A merism consists of two opposites or contrasting parts expressing a totality. That is a merism. And here are some examples. Psalms 89 verse 11. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. So you have one extreme up there, the heavens, and you have another extreme down there, that's the earth. Two opposites. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. So the two extremes and everything in between belongs to God. That's a merism. Uh, another one would be God knows your standing up and your sitting down and everything in between. Psalms 89 verse 12, the north and the south Thou hast created them, Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. So the north and the south are his dominion and everything in between. That's a merism. Ezekiel 21 verse 3, And say to the land of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north. There's a merism in its totality. So that's what a merism is. And if we consider the kings of the north and the king of the south as a merism, well, then there is a totality between them and if they make an alliance then that totality makes an alliance in conflict with God. Daniel 11 verse 27 gives us a clue that although these kings are opposites and in conflict or apparent conflict there's something more to it because it says in verse 27 and both these kings hearts shall be to do mischief. And they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Now, by looking at these verses as a form of a merism doesn't negate the literal interpretations that we have. It just adds another dimension. And it, it's fascinating. Let's have a look at some of the actions of the king of the north. Daniel 11 verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. So the king of the north is trying to get an allegiance with all who are against God's covenant. So he is antichrist and he's trying to pocket them all. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They will resist him. So you'll always have these two opposing forces on the earth. And they that understand amongst the people shall instruct many, yet there shall fall by the sword and by, by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. This power has one aim and one aim alone, the obliteration of true worship. So in a final conflict with this power, God's people will be facing a force that has no other intention than to obliterate them. And the king shall do according to his will, verse 36, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Here is the little horn power that exalts itself, that pretends to be God, that sits in its katitstos cathedral position, pretending to be God. He shall not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, 
And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. So this power is using a false religion to gather the religious bodies of the world into his camp. I think that is pretty clear from these verses. Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So you're either subject to him or you are in conflict with him. He will not leave you alone because this is a war. So let's analyze this. Both the kings of the north and the south are enemies of God. Both of them. Because they're sitting at one table. They are discussing. They are uh, making allegiances. So both must be under the control of the arch deceiver. Both must belong to Satan. Employing a Hegelian dialectic to induce a collective mindset conducive to his schemes. So here are two apparently opposite forces that are inducing a collective mindset which is at war with the word of God and God's covenant people. This is fascinating. This is how he works. This is how he uses the scenarios. So you have thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So typologically, the king of the north must represent the religio-political alliances that would attempt to force God's people to worship according to its dictates, just as Babylon tried to force the Hebrews to worship according to its dictates. So when Nebuchadnezzar took the Hebrews captives, what did he try to do? He tried to force them to worship his deities. He changed their names. He sent them to the university. He trained them in the religion of Babylon. So that's the one force. That is the Babylonian one. That's the king of the north. That's what, how he operated. But the king of the south, geographically Egypt, enslaved the people of God, refused to acknowledge Yahweh, or the right of the Hebrews to worship him, I will not let them go. So they couldn't worship him according to their conscience, but he didn't force them to worship the Egyptian deities. He left them alone. So what kind of mindset is this? This is an enslaving mindset, but it doesn't force you into another religion, therefore it is a secular mindset. So the one king must be a religio, political power, and the other one must be a secular power. And both of them are inducing a mindset which is at war with the word of God. So the motives of the king of the south were secular, whereas the motives of the king of the north were religio-political. Does that make sense? I think that makes some sense. Destruction, however, comes from the north. So in the final analysis, what Satan really wants is worship. And he wants to gain access to your mind. Then the Lord said unto me, out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. He's talking about Jerusalem, Jeremiah here. So the king of the north eventually will overrun Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 1, he says, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire in Bet Aserem, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. So in the final events of this planet, the great enemy to keep your eye on is the king of the north. Behold, the noise of the brute is coming in a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. 
Some people are so involved in watching the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south between these two mindsets that they think that the king of the north is toothless, but the Bible tells us destruction comes from him. Jeremiah 47 verse 2, And thus says the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land, and all that is therein, the city, and them that dwell therein. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. 50 verse 3, for out of the north there comes up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. This is a conflict for the mind. And don't underestimate the king of the north, because he comes in many shapes and sizes. And he will have a philosophy ready for every mindset on the planet. Don't underestimate this king. Now historically, if we look at these two powers, the king of the north occupied this territory. Babylon is actually lying virtually due east. But when Babylon attacked, it always came via the route of the fertile crescent. This was the way in which the armies marched. This is the way they had to march if they wanted to have food and access to what an army needs. It needs to run on, on victuals. It can't just run on desert dust. And so the attacks always came out of the north. And the king of the south, he would, of course, come from the bottom. Jeremiah 46, verse 10, And this is the day of the Lord of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the short sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and make drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. So God's conflict is with whom? With the king of the north. And the final battle will be against this king of the north because this king of the north is a usurper. He wants to take the position of God because he wants worship. In actual fact, Satan is the one that wants to occupy the north. That is, he claims worship, a prerogative of God alone. Now it's interesting that in Canaanite mythology, the god Baal dwelt in the north. But the true north, the real north, belongs to God. Because he is the God of the north. So you have two deities who are of the north. The one is a counterfeit, and the other one is the real one. And finally, the counterfeit one will be destroyed in that country by the river Euphrates which stands for the people that feed the king of the north. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above even the angelic host. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. He wants that position. He wants the north position which belongs to God. And the north position means worship. He wants the worship. So he sets himself up as the king of the north. Now this comes from Luther's writing, Luther on Islam and the Papacy, by Reverend Professor Dr. F. N. Lee. And this was Luther's view. It's amazing how these reformers saw things. The king in Daniel 11.36 explains Reverend Professor Martin Luther, so writes Dr. Lee, clearly depicts the Pope who unashamedly bellows forth his decretals. He's now quoting Martin Luther. As the sun is over the moon, so too is the Pope over the emperor. Not the emperor, but the Pope is emperor. For the emperor, like a vassal, kisses the pope's feet. The latter puts himself above holy scripture 
as the prophet Daniel says, 1136, against the God of gods, other tyrants persecuting God's word have done so in ignorance. This one does it knowingly. While calling Holy Scripture God's word, he wishes to lord over it, hence he may be called an earthly god. In 2 Thessalonians 2, there it is revealed that he is the man of sin and the son of perdition who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, like God, sits in the temple of God exhibiting himself as God. It is not just as a private and as a personally lost sinner that he is here called the man of sin and the son of perdition, but as a public figure who drags others with him into sin and perdition. That was the Protestant view. And I believe that this view is spot on. Martin Luther went so far to state, if you do not contend with your whole heart against the impious government of the Pope, you cannot be saved. Whoever takes delight in the religion and worship of popery will be eternally lost in the world to come. If you reject it, popery, you must expect to incur every kind of danger, even to lose your lives, but it is far better to be exposed to such perils in this world than to keep silence. So long as I live, I will denounce to my brethren the sore and plague of Babylon for fear that many who are with us should fall back like the rest into the bottomless pits. These are powerful words. And I'm wondering whether the time to repair the breach that has come in Protestant thinking should not be repaired. From the reformers, let's go to the pioneers of the Adventist movement. So the pioneers of the Advent movement from their consecrated study of, word of God came to virtually the same conclusion that the power referred to in the closing verses of Daniel 11 was the papacy. There was one condescending voice, and that was that of Uriah Smith, who tried to introduce the idea that the king of the north should represent Turkey. But James White countered with the following, and he said, Elder Smith has given a very fine talk on the 11th chapter of Daniel, and his interpretation seems plausible. But if... The legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay in the second chapter represent Rome and the nondescript ten-horned beast and the little horn of the seventh chapter represent Rome and if the little horn which waxed exceeding great of the eighth chapter represents Rome, the king of the north represents Rome also. These are four parallel prophecies, prophecies brethren, reaching down to the coming of our Lord. <laughs> what is interesting is that Ellen White rebuked him for saying this. Not because he was wrong, but because he did it on this pu public platform rather than going to his brother and saying, brother, do you not want to reconsider what you're thinking there? So this was the view that was held by Protestantism, and this is the view that was held by Pioneer Adventism. Louis F. Ware writes, when it is remembered that Daniel's last prophecy was given as the fitting conclusion to the very important prophecies which had preceded it, its importance will be seen. All the previous prophecies of Daniel have their consummation in the last prophecy. This prophecy was revealed to him after he had spent three weeks in fasting and prayer in order to obtain clearer light on the previous prophecies. So don't you think it's important for us to know what it means? I believe so. It is obvious, therefore, that unless we approach the subject in the light of the prophecies which have preceded it, we shall not understand aright the climax of them all, the ending of the king of the north at Jerusalem. We need to study these things. He continues, both Daniel and John foretold the dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance. Daniel 12, verse 1. Because when you pass Daniel 11, you're going home. 
John described these dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance of the people of God in connection with the satanic forces of spiritual Babylon, Revelation 13 to 19. Daniel described the same things in connection with the king of the north. As the king of the north does the same work as the papacy, there can be but one conclusion, namely that the king of the north refers to the papacy. And I agree with him. There is no other conclusion that is possible. This is the view of the Reformation. This is the view of Adventism. Let's have a look at some of the typological aspects of the King of the North because there are some fascinating parallels which can help us with this and we can start to understand what the events are that are unfolding on this planet right now so one of the typologies here is the typology of Tyre. And the prince and the king serve as a model for the final conflict. I found this study fascinating. Ezekiel 28 verse 2 says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Tyrus, Thus says the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Where do we find parallel language to that? We find parallel language to that only in relation to the prophecies that deal with papal supremacy. So the prince of Tyre is here taking the position typologically speaking, of the papal power. He sets himself up as another god. He will change times and laws and he will uh, rule according to his dictates. But the Bible continues and says, yet thou art a man and not a god. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, and 26 verse 7 says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and with companies and much people. Now, this is a, a, a typology within a typology. In typology, when God speaks about a king that comes, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's necessary conflict or not conflicting but this is fascinating so king of Babylon will conquer Tyre here we are dealing with mindset so let's think about that the man of sin makes the same claims as the prince of Tyre he wants to set himself up as God so he sits in the seat that's within the temple within the church the katizo the cathedral seat usurping the position of God in his religio-political capacity as the beast out of the sea, Revelation 13. He receives his seat and authority from the dragon himself because that's what it says in Revelation 13. Now Tyre is an interesting comparison because it also represents the economic power. Because the Phoenicians were the traders and the seafarers and the symbol of the ships in the Bible deals with the economy. So by conquering this power, the king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the north, literally speaking, claims this economic power for himself and fuses religious supremacy with economic supremacy. So the real prince of Tyre is the prince of Babylon. He controls not only the religious aspects, but also the economic aspects. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So he, as God, sits in the temple of God. He sits, showing himself that he is God. And Revelation 13, verse 2, The beast which I saw, which was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of the bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat. So we have all these parallel verses linking this philosophical thinking together 
typologically. And he had great authority. Now what is great authority? Great authority must mean that you control those aspects of the world which give you control over humanity. That means you must control the political, you must control the educational, the economical, all those issues, you must have control of them, otherwise you won't have great authority, you'll have some authority. So this seat, he takes as a usurper, it actually belongs to God. Because he sits on the throne and his throne is in the north, as Ezekiel describes, the throne is coming from the north. His kingdom is therefore also in the north, God's kingdom. Revelation 7, 7 verse 15 says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell amongst them. And Ezekiel saw this coming from the north. So the throne of God is in the north and there he receives worship. And here's the usurper. He puts his throne in the north and he receives worship. It's a conflict of worship. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, the same power as the little horn power. And Wesley comments, I just want to always bring us back to what the reformers believe, that people may understand this is not some modern concept, this is a, a deep-rooted understanding of prophecy that has come a long way. Wesley writes, this beast, Revelation 13.1, is the Romish papacy. As it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer to this and no other power on earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point. This beast is a spiritually secular power. Opposite to the kingdom of Christ, the power not merely spiritual or ecclesiastical, not merely secular or political, but a mixture of both. The beast is now existing, he's not passed for Rome, is now existing and it is not till after the destruction of Rome that the beast is thrown into the lake. This is Protestant understanding. And this mindset has to be conquered by the papacy. Wouldn't it be nice if he could secularize humanity to get rid of any religious understanding and once he has achieved that by his Hegelian conflict, to then infuse the mind again with his concept. You first have to get rid of truth out of the minds of men before you can infuse your error. Now this prince of Tyre was Etbal, the literal one referred to there in the prophecy at the time the prophecy was made. He was Etbal. Now who was Etbal? He was the father of Jezebel. You know, there's some fascinating things here. Who had married Ahab, the king of Israel, and had led the nation into Baal worship. And it is the prince. And prince here in the Hebrew is Nagid, a commander as occupying the front, civil, military, or religious. So here is a religio-political prince, an earthly one who assumes the authority of God. He's a chief, an excellent thing, a governor, a leader, a noble, a prince, a ruler. 1 King 16 verse 31 give us the uh, genealogies here, and it came to pass as he had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, that he took to wife, talking about King Ahab now, Jezebel, the daughter of Etbal, king of the Zidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. And Etbal, with Baal, Phoenician king. So this was the king of Tyre. This was the prince of Tyre, the ruler, the earthly king. Baal means master, husband, lord, owner. Can you see the conflict between Christ and another deity here? Now who stands behind the papal power? The Bible says the dragon gave him his seat and his authority. Now who stands behind this earthly prince over here? 
So let's transition from prince to king. Ezekiel 28 verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. So you had a prince, and now you have a king. And say unto him, Thus says the Lord God that sealeth up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. King, the word there in the original is melech, which means king, royal. Whereas the other word that was used was that of prince. So there's a difference between the two. Now who is this prince? If we carry on in Ezekiel, he tells us who he is. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of power. Thou wast perfect in the ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So behind the earthly prince stands another prince. But this one was in Eden and he was an anointing cherub. So who gave that earthly one his power? The dragon gave him his power. So we have exactly the same typological explanation as we finally get in the final king of the north. And so we can get an understanding of what he controls. He not only has the religious world at his feet, politically, religiously, but he has the economic power in his grasp. Let's continue, Ezekiel 28 verse 16. This is the power behind him. By the multitude of thy what? Merchandise. They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thine beauty, describing the fall of Satan. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thou hast thy sanctuaries, religious connotation, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. He controls all economic aspects as well. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Here's this conflict between the true God of the north and the counterfeit God of the north. The counterfeit God of the north has Lucifer as his authority who gives him his power. So typologically, the literal earthly ruler of Tyre serves as a type for the end time earthly ruler. And Satan is the true instigator behind the scenes who gives him his seat and great authority. The thrust and counter thrust between the king of the north and the south are intended to induce a collective mindset which will bring final unity in terms of opposition they both cherish towards God's people. So here is a Hegelian conflict. Satan wants total subservience and worship. The king of the north is his avenue for securing worship. That's what he's after. And the king of the south is the avenue for securing unbelief and rebellion against God. That's how they're fighting each other. The king of the north in the immediate context is Babylon and represents end time Babylon, which is the fusion of religious systems of the world under the control of the papacy. So all the religious systems must come together because they deal with the issue of worship. Now think about that. There are people out there who claim that Islam is the king of the south and the papacy is the king of the north. Now here we have a problem. Don't they both seek worship? So that must be a wrong interpretation. In fact, they must be in harmony to get God's people off the track to worship them. So the king of the north 
is, represents end time Babylon with the fusion of religious systems of the world under the control of the papacy and the kings of the world will they bow down to the system and lend their power unto it thus creating the religio-political beast which is controlled by the woman, the church. Eventually, everybody capitulates and walks at his heel. So he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the scarlet color represents this Roman power empowered by the dragon. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, colored in, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. So here she is, a church, but also in control of a system, a political system. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So the king of the south, if he doesn't represent religious worship, then he must re represent the opposite, the Hegelian opposite. So he must represent humanism. He must represent evolutionism. Atheism, secularism, existentialism. Those are the mindsets which take people away from God but do not lead directly to worship. So all exerting their influence to eliminate God and rely on human strength, human wisdom, human feeling alone to order the world. And these two philosophies, this philosophy of the king of the south and the philosophy of the king of the north, they are in apparent conflict. But actually, they sit at the same table because they have the same boss behind them. So all of these ideas were in some form or another also propagated and even initiated by Jesuit philosophers such as Voltaire, Descartes, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, as well as countless others to this very day. So, if the church philosophers, the Jesuits, are often behind these very philosophers, then I want to ask you the question, is the king of the north and the king of the, the south not sitting at the same table and discussing behind the scenes how they can overcome God's people? Existentialism, what does that mean? It's a noun. A philo philosophical attitude associated especially with Heidegger, Jaspers, Marcel, Sartre, and opposed to rationalism and empiricism that stresses the individual's unique position as self-determining agent responsible for the authenticities of his or her choices. And this is the modern philosophy of the world. You switch on the television, they'll tell you the power comes from within. You have to dig deep into your resources and pick yourself up. Isn't that the philosophy of the world? Of all the talk shows that you will find in the world, this is the one mindset. But the king of the north is the one who will finally call the shots. Now, I found a fascinating statement by General Franco of Spain, who was the Roman Catholic champion. He says, Our war is not a civil war, but a crusade. Yes, our war is a religious war. We who fight, whether Christian or Muslim, isn't that interesting? Are soldiers of God, and we are not fighting against men, but against atheism and materialism. General Franco. So the war, the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south, is a battle for the mind. And people 
would love to see it otherwise and to literalize it so they can sit at home on their chairs, switch on the television and see who's going to win. Is it going to be Russia? Who's going to come into Jerusalem? Is it Islam that's doing this? And it doesn't affect you because you can watch it on television. But this battle is a battle for the mind. And it comes to each and every single one of us individually. This is the real battle. The other one is a fake. It's a counterfeit. It's a rouge. It's a lie. Here's another interesting typology of the North-South conflict. You must always look at the Bible. The Bible is a very complete record. So we've looked at the king of Tyre and that aspect. And now let's look at the typology of the north versus the south because the literal conflict can tell us something about the spiritual conflict. Now, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar's rise to power, and he's the one who finally overran Jerusalem, in other words, he tried to gain their mindset and change them into another religious format. His opponent from the south was the Pharaoh nature. Second Kings 23, 29, in the days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, because the king of Assyria was in conflict with a rising Babylon that was supposed to be subject to it, but Babylon took over. And Necho came to help the Assyrians. So he came to the river Euphrates and King Uzziah went against him. You remember that? And Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. That's an interesting story in itself. And we'll look at it in a later lecture. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Now Pharaoh Necho came put him in prison at Riblah in the land of Hamat that he might not reign in Jerusalem and he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah king in place of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim and Pharaoh took Jehoahaz and went to Egypt and he died there. So who controlled Jerusalem? The king of the south. Here's a conflict. And if you look at the, the historic records, then they'll tell you in 610, he inherited the war against Babylon. In 609, his intervention in Palestine when he killed Josiah. Uh, Chronicles tells you about the story. And uh, then came the wars with Nabopolassar, who was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. So Babylon starts waxing. And uh, here is the clay tablet, the late years of Nabopolassar. And it says on that tablet, three years later, the aging king of Babylon, Nabopolassar, sent his son Nebuchadnezzar against the Egyptian armies. The encounter took place at Carchemish in the year 605 before the common era. Nothing common about it in the old days. They used to say before Christ. Defeating the Egyptian armies, Nebuchadnezzar scours the land of Israel and subjugates Joachim, but the news of his father's death precipitates his return. He hurries back, taking with him young captives from the elite of Judah, including Daniel and his companies. 605, Nebuchadnezzar defeats Necho. So you have this conflict. The king of the north, the king of the south. First the king of the, the south controls, then the king of the north comes against him and he beats him back. 601, Babylon attack on Egypt is repelled. So the king of the north receives a thrust from the king of the south. Loss of Judah, Jerusalem is captured by the Babylonians. Death of Necho II, he's succeeded by his son. Nietzsche names are sometimes erased from his monuments because the people feel he lost to the king of the north. Jeremiah 46, 20 said, Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh, it cometh out of the north. So typologically, literally, 
it happened that way and antitypically it will happen the same way. Now if you go to that country where this battle at Karkemish took place, it was in Syria, and today Syria is in the news and people will tell you that this is the start of this great conflict that will take place between the Christian world and the Islamic world and some will introduce this as the king of the north and the king of the south scenario. I'm afraid it's not like that. These powers of worship are on the same side typologically. They are all subject to the king of the north. So if we go to that country, you will see that it is a country that reflects primitive ways. The vehicles and the motorbikes and the people and the world is duped into this idea that it should shake and quake in fear for these powerful people that will overrun society. Beware of this old gentleman. You never know what they might do. You're going back into a previous area if you're going to these places. This is not a battle where we have to fear them in a military conflict. This is a battle for the mind that we are dealing with. They are pointing to a tell which tells the story. A tell is a mound of... Uh, previous cities, one on top of the other, there it is. And it is the University of Edinburgh, Scotland's excavations of this battle and this conflict. And it tells us that here at Karkemesh, the king of the north overran Egypt. And finally, he will do it at the end of time. Thus, the typical king of the north overwhelmed the typical king of the south just before Babylon's final thrust against literal Jerusalem. When that took place, Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem. So when the king of the north's mindset overruns secularism at the end of time, that's when he will thrust towards Jerusalem. And the destruction of the first sanctuary. In the first antitype of this destruction, Rome, the new king of the north, would destroy the second temple in 70 AD. So the parallels are perfect. The type has an antitype which refers to another and which serves as a type for a further antitype. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. I'm not going to deal with Daniel chapter 9. This is the 70 week prophecy. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come, Rome, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The final conflict is being set up. And the antitype of the literal prince of Rome will be the spiritual prince of antitypical Rome, and the same conflict for the mindset of God's people is about to unfold on this world. Now in the next section of this lecture, we will deal with the final few verses of Daniel chapter 11, and we will show exactly how the king of the north will overrun the king of the south philosophy. May the Lord help us as we study his word. Amen.